All right, so here they're saying, calculate the pH at the equivalence point in the titration of 25 ml of 0.1 molar formic acid with a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution. Given pKa of formic acid is equal to 3.74. Okay, so see, basically they are talking about titration of an acid and a base. Okay, so what do we know? We know that at equivalence point of such a titration, the number of equivalence of the number of equivalents of your formic acid will, uh, will be equal to the number of equivalents of sodium hydroxide. So based on this, what we'll do is first we'll find out the volume of sodium hydroxide that was used. Once you find out the volume of sodium hydroxide, then you should be able to find out what is the number of equivalents of salt formed. Okay, once you have the uh, number of equivalents of salt formed, go ahead, find out the concentration. Once you find out the concentration, then uh, you can apply the formula for salt hydrolysis here. Okay, you can uh, find the pH by salt hydrolysis formula. So this is what we have. Let's see. So you had formic acid solution and this was 25 ml of 0 0.01. What is it? 0.1. Sorry, it's 0.1. So this is given to you. Then you have NaOH, right? So they have not given the volume, but they have given 0.1 molar solution. Now, at equivalence point, their equivalents are going to be the same. And since both of them have the same N factor, I can equate this. I can say that this is some X ml and these two will become equal. So then I can just cancel this out and my X will be equal to 25 ml or the volume of sodium hydroxide used will be 25 ml. Now, when I talk about the salt that is formed by the combination or by the reaction of formic acid and sodium hydroxide, I basically get the salt that is called HCOONA sodium formate. Okay, now sodium formate is in solution, which means it will dissociate to give you Na plus plus your formate ion okay salt hydrolysis it's very important that you remember that the sodium formate is a weak acid plus strong base salt so here your pH expression becomes pKw plus pKa plus log C whole divided by Okay, we have to find out the concentration of this sodium formate. So now we need to know what is the number of equivalents of your sodium formate. So number of equivalents of salt formed will be equal to number of equivalents of acid reacted or base reacted, which is so 25 into 10 to the power of minus 3 volume multiplied by molarity, which is 0.1. N factor is anyway one, so you multiply, don't multiply, doesn't make a difference. So 25 into 10 to the power of minus 4 equivalents. Okay, 25 into 10 to the power of minus 4 equivalents of salt in 50 ml of solution. Why? Because 50 ml is the final volume of the solution. 25 ml from here plus 25 ml from here, so 50 ml. So cancel this out, this will be 1 by 2. Now what do you have? You have 1 by 2 into 10 to the power of minus 4 equivalents per ml or I can say here the concentration of the solution will become 0 0.05 molar. Since n factor is 1 for the salt, I can say 0 0.05 normal or 0 0.05 molar. Doesn't make a difference. Okay, so now let's talk about the pH expression. This is going to be pKw. What is the value of pKw? They have not mentioned any temperature. So you can assume that it is room temperature. pKw will be 14. Plus, what do you have? You have 3.74 as the pKa of formic acid plus log C. Okay, divided by 2. Let's find out log C. This is nothing but, one second, yeah. So log C is log of... 5 into 10 to the power of minus 2, which is nothing but minus 2 plus log 5. That is minus 2 plus 0.7. So this is going to be minus 1.3. So now what do you have? You have 14 plus 7.3. So 14 plus 7 point, uh, sorry, 14 plus 3.74, sorry. So that will be 17.74 minus 1.3 divided by 2. So now what do you have? You have 4 
and then you have 4 and then what you have you have 16.44 divided by 2 now cancel it out you get 8.22 so your pH of final solution is going to be 8.22 which is suggested here in option C so option C 8.22 is going to be the pH at the equivalence point of the given titration so option C is the right answer to this question Okay, so here they're saying choose the correct statement according to the valence bond theory. Okay, according to VBT, which of the following statements is correct? We'll read the statement, we'll mark true or false, right? Whatever is true is going to be the right answer to this question. So, you have option A. A sigma bond is stronger than a pi bond. Yes, this is true. A sigma bond is stronger than a pi bond due to more effective overlap. It takes more energy to break a sigma bond than it does to break a pi bond. So yes, sigma bond is stronger than a pi bond. This statement is true. Option B. S orbitals never form pi bonds. This is true, right? We always talk about P orbital or D orbital. We haven't yet, you know, reached a point where we can talk about bonding in F orbital. But I can assure you that we don't talk about S orbital when we talk about the pi bond. Why is that so? That is so because pi bond is formed by a lateral overlap. Okay, which means a sideways overlap. Okay, so now you'll say fine, I will take this P orbital and I will make this S orbital uh, you know, have a sideways overlap with it, that should give me a pi bond? No. So what happens is that this makes sense, this sideways or head-on collision, all of this makes sense only when there is a directionality to your orbital. Your S orbital is directionally neutral, which means if I approach my S orbital from this side or from this side, or from this side, there is going to be no difference, right? Any way that you approach an S orbital, it is going to form only a sigma bond because S orbitals are non-directional, okay? They are directionally neutral, fine? So S orbital can only be involved in the formation of a sigma bond because any collision with an S orbital is going to be a head-on collision. It's not, it's never going to be a sideways collisions not never going to be a sideways overlap or a lateral overlap which is what is required for a pi bond okay so yes this statement is very much true now option c there can be only one sigma bond present between two atoms okay so for this we'll have to explore a little bit of p orbitals because s you know can form only one bond right so let's see let's say you have P orbitals so you have one like this one so these both are perpendicular to the axis and this is along the axis right so here what are the possible overlaps this okay and this is going to give you your sigma bond now second overlap that's possible is this correct so this overlap is it going to give you a sigma bond no it's going to give you a pi bond now the third one that I'm drawing with light green, that's going to overlap like this, right? And then again, it's a lateral overlap or a sideways overlap because of which again you will get a pi bond, right? So let's see, let me use a different color here. So here, this is give you, giving you a sigma bond, but the other two overlaps are giving you pi bonds, right? Which means although whatever these atoms are, they are able to form three different bonds, but only one of them is a sigma bond. So yes, between any two atoms, even if there are more than one bonds, the number of sigma bonds will only be one, right? Best example is carbon, okay? Think about carbon. Have you ever seen that a carbon-carbon double bond is there where, you know, this is a sigma bond and this is also a sigma bond? I haven't, so if you come across it, please let me know, right? This is what happens. So yes, this statement is also true. You can see that all three statements are true, which means option D, all of the above, is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here they're saying that a balloon containing one mole of air initially at one ATM is filled further with air till the pressure increases to four ATM. Fine. The initial diameter of the balloon is one meter and the pressure at each stage is proportional to the diameter of the balloon. Very important. How many moles of air was needed to change the pressure from 1 atm to 4 atm? Fine. 
so these are your options and what you basically need to understand here is that this is a question that is based on your ideal gas law pv is equal to nrt fine they have not mentioned anything about the temperature so your temperature and r are going to be constants and you will have to use the relation pv by n is a constant okay now they have you know in some or the other twisted form provided you a lot of data so let's start collecting that data you have p1 is equal to 1 atm you have p2 is equal to 4 atm okay you have n1 is equal to 1 mole you don't know what is n2 right you have to find out n2 minus n1 basically that is the question and then you have initial diameter okay so d1 by uh, d1 is given to you as 1 meter d2 we don't know right and one important thing that they've mentioned here is that pressure is di directly proportional to diameter okay at every stage this is important let's see let's collect our thoughts so we have pv by n is a constant which means p1 v1 by n1 is equal to p2 v2 by n2 correct p1 is 1 atm v1 i can write it as 4 by 3 pi r1 r1 is nothing but d1 by 2 so d1 by 2 whole cube right divided by n1 is given to me as 1 is equal to p2 what is p2 second pressure value or the final pressure value which is given to us is 4 atm and n2 is given to us as n let's just find out n2 volume v2 is 4 by 3 pi d2 by 2 whole cube correct so let's cancel the, a few things out this will get cancelled this will get cancelled and yes let's cancel out the two okay so now what do we have we have d1 by d2 whole cube into four, uh, 1 by 4 is equal to 1 by n or alternatively just to make it look better i can write that n is equal to 4 into d2 by d1 whole cube d1 is given to me as 1 meter okay anyway it's okay even if you don't substitute because now we have uh, we have a relation which is given to us as p is directly proportional to d which means p by d is a constant so p1 by d1 is equal to p2 by d2 correct so now p1 is given to you i'll write it here so p1 is given to you as one atmosphere d1 is given to you as one meter p2 is given to you as four atmosphere d2 is given to you as d2 find out d2 d2 is going to be four meters correct substitute this here what do you get you get n is equal to four into four by one whole cube so four into four cube is 64 64 into four is nothing but 256 correct so your final number of moles n2 is 256 delta n is going to be what n2 minus n1 which is 256 minus 1 which is nothing but 255 right so you needed to add 255 more moles of air to get you know the balloon to the final conditions which means option c 255 is going to be the right answer to this question okay so here they're saying that the molecular mass of butyric acid was determined by experiment to be 88 gram per mole okay what is the molecular formula the empirical formula is given to you right c2 h4 o this is your empirical formula so you know that c2 h4 o taken some n times will give you the molecular formula correct very simply like rather mathematically we can talk about it like this so what do we know we know that the mass that we calculate from empirical formula let's say i will represent it by empirical formula mass i'm representing it by efm right so empirical formula mass multiplied by n is equal to your molar mass okay they have given you the molar mass or molecular mass in this case which means your n will become molar mass by empirical formula mass correct very um, crudely or rather very mathematically without using too much of our you know chemistry brains we can come to this conclusion right so let's go ahead with this and let's solve the question 
So here you have uh, C2H4O taken n times, right? Your empirical formula is C2H4O. So what is going to be the mass corresponding to C2H4O? Let's see, you have 2 into carbon plus 4 into hydrogen plus oxygen. You have to add the molar masses of these things. So 2 into carbon is going to be 2 into 12 gram per mole, which is 24 plus 4 hydrogen, right? So 4 into 1, which is nothing but 4. Plus, for oxygen, it is going to be 16 gram per mole. So you add 16. So 16 plus 4 is 20. 20 plus 24 is 44. So this is going to be 44 gram per mole, right? Or even if you want to ignore this gram per mole, you can simply write that your empirical formula mass came out to be 44. Now, you have to find out what? You have to find out your N. So N is going to be 88, which is your given molar mass divided by 44 that's going to come out to be 2. So your final molecular formula is going to be C2H4O taken twice or I can write it as properly I can write it as C4H8O2 um, right. So C4H8O2 wherever you are please make an appearance and it's here in option A. So option A C4H8O2 is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're saying that if an ion of uh, manganese, Mn, has a magnetic moment of 3.873 Bohr magneton, then the oxidation state of Mn is going to be what? Right? So basically, we are saying that for the excited state Mn x plus, our uh, magnetic moment is going to be 3.873 Bohr magneton. Right? What is the formula of magnetic moment? formula is under root of n into n plus 2 is equal to this 3.873 is the value given to us, right? So you have to basically find out the number of unpaired electrons from here. Then uh, you will go to the electronic configuration of manganese and from there you will remove so many um, electrons to see when you are reaching n and accordingly you will get your answer, okay? Cool. So see, now Basically, what you can do here is you can take a square root on both sides and you can get n into n plus 2 is equal to some value and from there you will have to do a little bit of a hit and trial to get your answer, okay? So, you have to square root both sides. Now, who is going to solve for the square of 3.873? I am not solving, okay? So, there has to be some shortcut, right? Okay, so specifically for this formula, I'll give you a shortcut that here, whatever for this formula, right, for this formula, whatever is the first number that you see, right, before the decimal point, the number that you see, that is generally the number of unpaired electrons, okay? If you do not agree with me, then well, I mean, it's okay if you don't agree, let me prove it to you, right? So, 3.8 is very close to 4, so when you square 4, you get 16, right? So, but since it's slightly lesser, I'm going to take it as 15. So, n into n plus 2 is equal to 15, right? This is possible only when n is equal to 3 and n plus 2 is equal to 5. So, 3 fives are 15. Correct? Any other combination is possible to get 15? No, right? So, for n and n plus 2 values, only these two values will fit in to give you 15. And as I had suggested the shortcut, 3 should be the number of unpaired electrons. And that is also what you got by solving the entire thing. Right? So, be smart about things. Don't have to calculate everything everywhere. Right here, this will be equal to 15. So, my n comes out to be equal to 3. So, number of unpaired electrons is going to be 3. Now, let's write down the ground state electronic configuration of manganese. So, what is the atomic number of manganese? Manganese ion. So, manganese is going to be 25. Right? So, here the electronic configuration becomes argon. Uh, first, we'll write 3D. So, 3D and then you have 4S. So, 4S2, 3D5. Correct? Now, in Mx, sorry, in MnX plus, what you have, what you have is argon 3D3, 4S0, okay? So, you can check out the um, difference here. Basically, your 2S electrons are knocked out and 5 minus 3, so 2. 2 plus 2, 4 electrons are knocked out in MnX plus, which means this will become Mn four plus right so manganese here is in the excited state of four plus or in plus four oxidation state whatever you want to call it which means option c plus four is going to be the right answer to this question 